thank everybody for being here. You know, we, um, if you think back to um, what we have always done, and many of you have been at this table and many of you have not, we have done round tables um, and tabletops every year, but they've always been hurricanes. But the way we did it, it worked. It was, we'd bring all the stakeholders together, we'd all talk, we'd do conference calls, always preparing for what never happened. And then suddenly, this past year, we didn't have one, we had two winter storms. And what we did is through all that preparation we had done for the hurricanes, we were able to put to work for the winter storms. And so um, those of you who have dealt with me know that I like conference calls and likes to talk a lot to get everybody communicating. So we were doing two to three a day during that winter storm. And it turned out to work really well. Last week, we decided um, to do a call, and it was on Ebola. And it was very much going through the same thing. And the point of that was to get all the stakeholders talking on the phone, get used to who was in charge of what, and making sure that we weren't leaving anything on the table. The point of this today is carrying that ball further. Um, you know, what I don't want to do is be that state that says we're ready, we're not concerned, we have no issues, um, because I don't think anybody can say that. What I do want to do is be that state that says we are prepared, we have communicated, we know where our loopholes are, and we know what we need to do. And so with that, the point of this is um, for you to talk about what we have done, talk about what we're in the process of doing, and then talk about where we're going. I think we all hope and um, know that the chances of something like this happening in South Carolina are very low at this point, um, but that doesn't matter to us. We want to be ready regardless, because usually when you go through these preparations, whether it's this or something else, it always comes back and, and happens to be helpful later on. So this is a time of preparing. It's also a time of educating. I think that with um, all of the chatter around the country about Ebola and what has happened, it's healthy for the public to know what we're doing and why we're doing it. It's also healthy to get the facts out there. That's what is most concerning to me, is making sure that the public has the right information out there so that they can feel informed and feel strong. Um, so with that, I know we've got a few people at the table. We're just going to kind of um, start talking, and then we'll open it up for any of you that aren't here. We've got all types of very cool people here at the table that have their hands in this pot. Um, you're going to see anybody from, you know, Dr. Chow, who knows the importance of um, isolation and what we need to do, not just what I appreciated you saying on the phone last week, was it's not just the medical community, it's the janitorial, it's the clinicians, it's all the way up to the health care that we have to make sure everybody is protected, all the way to Amy Duffy, who's with tourism, and you would say, well, why does tourism matter? Well. Anytime there's a natural disaster, tourism matters. If we have to get in touch with the airlines, if we have to know who's involved or what needs to happen, we keep all of those people at the table. Um, and so what we're going to do is, I think, first start with our state epidemiologist, um, Dr. Linda Bell, to um, just give us the state of where we are, what you can tell us, and just educate us some. Okay. Um, good afternoon. Uh, I know a lot is already known about Ebola. I'll just touch on some high points. And feel um, free to reiterate what you think is not, because too much is not a bad thing. Okay. Well, Ebola is spread by close physical contact with someone who is both infected and symptomatic. And by contact, that means exposure to a mucous membrane or a, a broken skin to the blood or body fluids of somebody who is actually sick with Ebola. And uh, Ebola is not transmitted by the airborne route. And protection against that direct contact with the skin or mucous membranes is the basis of uh, preventing the spread of the disease. People are not infectious if they do not have symptoms. The um, earliest symptoms of Ebola may appear anywhere from 2 to 21 days after exposure. And it is that maximum 21-day incubation period that is the basis for the uh, 21 days for monitoring individuals. And individuals are not restricted during that 21-day period because they are infectious. They're restricted during that 21-day period to monitor for symptoms and so that any potential contact at the first sign of symptoms can be minimized once they become ill. So during that 21-day period, they're not kept in isolation because they're contagious. Um, 
Widespread transmission of Ebola in the United States is unlikely because of infection control practices that we have here, because of uh, our health care system and measures that are completely different from what uh, is available to uh, those West African countries that are severely infected. The, um, this is actually shown by the effectiveness of the stringent control measures that were implemented in Nigeria after the importation of one case. And currently, Nigeria, the most populous country in uh, Africa, is no longer on the list of countries of concern for travel because they have contained and interrupted Ebola transmission there. Uh, we've also learned this from the experience in Dallas, where we now know that no one that had exposure to Mr. Duncan prior to the onset of his symptoms developed illness. Um, they've all been released from that 21-day period without illness. No one in South Carolina has Ebola. We have responded to numerous reports of individuals with uh, suspicious travel histories or uh, suspicious symptoms. And our surveillance system is very effective in identifying these individuals and following up, but we have no known cases here and no one is currently um, being monitored for Ebola in South Carolina. One of the most important facts that the general public should understand to reduce unwarranted concern about exposure is that contact with blood or body fluid of someone while they were ill without proper use of protective equipment is the exposure risk that we want to educate people about. So it is not casual contact. It is not uh, contact with someone who has a potential history to an area of concern and otherwise, in other words, contacts to contacts are not at risk. Um, but the, the risk of importation does exist. However, there are uh, just recently implemented new screening measures by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention at the five major hubs that will receive approximately 95% of travelers from the West African countries that are affected by Ebola. And they're estimating that, that this will mean about 150 people, 100 to 150 people may be screened in the United States each day who are returning to those five major hubs. They will be screened um, prior to departure from the West African countries. They will be screened when they arrive at these uh, five hubs. And that screening will include uh, visually monitoring for signs of illness, taking their temperature. And individuals will also be given a uh, a packet of information to contact their local health department at their final destination, and local health departments will actively monitor by calling these individuals twice a day to, get, to check on their health status during the 21-day period. Uh, and I should also mention that they've lo lowered the three, the excuse me, the fever threshold, so that uh, it, it gives us the ability to detect illness as early as possible with the, with the first onset of symptoms. And the, the presence of fever is the, uh, the first symptom that's seen in the majority of individuals. Thank you. And what is that new threshold? The new threshold is um, 100.4 degrees Fahrenheit, or 38 degrees centigrade. OK, thank you very much. We appreciate it. Now we are going to, we've got four lead agencies that are helping us deal with this. So we're going to start with our first one. I also want to thank um, the chairman of DHEC for being here with us, Alan Amsler. Thank you for being here. And so we will go to Director Catherine Templeton. Thank you, Governor. And um, to your point about communication and following along with what you've, um, the example you've set, um, of course, DHEC has been working on this, uh, as you know, um, since the summer. And we've ramped up um, and pulled in agencies cooperatively more and more. We have a weekly call. Um, on your mark, we had a um, meeting this morning with all the different agencies. And we did exactly what you just said. We are communicating. We have identified any um, areas that we need to further and more robustly investigate. And I think we're ready. Um, we have a very, um, we're very fortunate in South Carolina that we have a statewide trauma um, system. And so three of our hospitals have stepped up to not only be prepared, but are willing with volunteers of experts to take on a patient if a patient becomes sick with Ebola. Um, one of the challenges, and I, I think that we continue to hear about it, is simply making sure that people are comfortable, that everyone is comfortable um, at, at, the, at the public level. And so while everyone needs to, to feel confident that if we have a case, 
we have the people who can contain it and can treat it. It's getting out that information also that those who may come into contact with it can very easily uh, be safe. And, and so we have the DHEC website, scdhec.gov, for public, for nurses, for 911 operators, for, for missionaries, for anyone, that gives very basic and good information that will, I think, make people feel a lot more comfortable about how safe we are in South Carolina. You were working on getting all the email addresses together and all that information. How far have you come in that? In terms of the whole pie, how much, what percentage do you think we have of that? So for nurses, for example, we probably have half. Um, there are about 60,000 nurses in South Carolina, and it wasn't until a couple of years ago that we started collecting email addresses. So what we have are in, are in that system, and then we're sending letters out to everyone else. Um, and you can replicate that, pick up chiropractors, doctors, veterinarians, dentists, um, coroners, but thankfully um, our, our board um, put out a public order saying if you are licensed, if you are one of these categories, you need to send us your email address. And again, it's the DHEC website and we've made it very easy um, to sign up. And importantly, this is, this is information that is to be helpful to those who are in that system. It's a, it, you, you, should be proud of, you should be proud of it. It's the first time in history that South Carolina has, um, has one repository for all these first responders and health care workers um, and it's because we followed the the guidance of bringing all the all the groups together so everyone at this table has been helpful in that very good thank you um, one question that we talked about last week we talked about the fact that we have multiple companies that can handle the waste removal but we didn't know if we had specific companies ready to handle this waste removal right. have we done anything on that yes ma'am the um, Fortunately, Friday morning, DOT sent out a blanket exemption because most of the um, removal companies, whether it's, there's cleanup, there's transport, and there is then incinerate, basically. And under CDC guidance, there's not anything different about Ebola than any other biohazard. However, people are, you know, reticent to put the ashes in their, in their waste dumps. But we've got those licensed. Um, there is a company that is handling national, nationally handling this and they've been given a dispensation to pull in the big bulk that would happen if we had any, any kind of problems. They were on the phone with us this morning um, at your round table. And if, if possible, and it's only because you never know what people's reactions are when this happens, I'd like us to get MOUs with people who are willing to do that. Yes. So I know that there's people saying we'll do it now, but I don't want people turning away from us then. So if we could get um, some in-state three companies that we knew were going to be there and then also have an out-of-state company because we just want to make sure that should that happen that's an issue I think that would be helpful yes ma'am okay thank you and now we're going to turn it over to someone who we're not strangers when it comes to emergencies um Kim Stenson I will tell you was an absolute rock star when it came to the winter storms and um has an unbelievable ability to stay calm and pull everybody together. And so I appreciate that. I don't think we ever thought we'd talk about this, but what works for hurricanes and what works for winter storms, if you take that same communication level, it can work for health um, issues as well. So I'll go ahead and let you go ahead. Okay, thank you, Governor. Uh, as Director Templeton said, we've been working very closely with DHEC uh, in terms of the plan development and validation. We've got a good state emergency operations plan, which is the 90% solution but then you got the 10% differences in each is, and that's basically what we're working on right now, but we're, we're, we're getting there on that in terms of that and the, uh, the validation process. But from an overall emergency management standpoint, we're gonna treat this just like you said, like any other emergency. And we've got the, the infrastructure, we've got the people uh, to handle that just like we did during the ice storm. Uh, we have, uh, we've got a very fortunate, we've got a very mature state emergency response team they all know each other, they know their capabilities, they know their agency's capabilities, and they know how to get things done. So we're very fortunate in that respect. And we've planned together, trained together, and we've operated together. So there's no question in my mind that from our standpoint is that that will go well if we get to the point where we need to have to uh, uh, activate the SEAC and, and activate the state emergency response team. So pending any questions, that's pretty much where we're at. Okay, so let's go back to what we've talked about, which is when is so before we would have certain levels that we mm -hmm. would trigger. Have we been able to come up with those levels and the triggers of each of those levels? Well, we're looking at that right now, and okay. I'm working with uh, Director Templeton and also your office on that, and we, we've got a recommendation that we're probably going to send over to, uh, to your office today on that. But for, uh, 
for the state level, what we're thinking right now is when we start to get state requests from, from the locals or state agencies that are involved in the plan actually have to do missions and uh, actually go out there and do something, at that point, we'd probably take a look at that, make a recommendation. And, that, and again, that's what we're looking for is level one, level two, level three, at what point something happens, who we, in, who we activate, and then at level two, yes, and then what it takes it to the, okay, that's very what good. We're, that's what we're putting together right now. Very good. And then in terms of dealing with the counties, have re you reached out to the counties, and are they? Uh, I, have, I have some, but that's something uh, we've got to do a little more of. We've got uh, right now that most of the counties, uh, at least some of them have been on the calls, the county emergency management folks. Uh, we're setting up something for the three major counties uh, later this week, the ones that we think that the hospitals might be involved in. Um, so we'll work through that process and make sure that we keep them in a loop because, as you know, it's very important that we all understand that this starts at the local level and works its way up. So they're they're the ones that we have to support. So we need to be able to. If you could, that. what I'd like for us to do, and I think y'all would have to do this together, is on the county level, um, in education, you know, to have Dr. Bell there and to have y'all there to where we talk about what you do and what you don't sure. do until we can get those teams in. Um, I think it's just important that you know they're going to be the first ones on the scene that know what's happening. Until we can get that person moved to the next area, we want to make sure they know what they're doing. So just an educational where all our EMDs from across the state come in, half day, learn what they need to learn. For a lot, I know they've already heard it, but it would be good if they all heard it in the same room. Okay. And Governor, we are um, we have sent out guidance to the counties and are going to exercise on regional basis, so that will be local up in, in the regions next week. Perfect. Perfect. Okay, and now we will move to General Bob Livingston, now South Carolina National Guard. Governor, we're, uh, of course, supporting the uh, Emergency Operations Center with situational awareness uh, capabilities and working with the planning uh, with our uh, uh, EMD. Uh, in addition, uh, we, we are able to backstop the state agencies with our uh, civil support team. Uh, the, uh, uh, of course, our military is trained in biological and chemical uh, instances, and uh, we have a specialized team uh, that uh, exercises that every day. There uh, can go all the way up to hazmat, A, uh, alpha, uh, uh, and uh, this one actually qualifies as a hazmat C. So we have uh, quite a bit of equipment that can do isolation and uh, decontamination. We do not have the ability to do the testing. Obviously, that would have to come through the medical community. Uh, the other thing that we're offering is uh, some of the training as far as uh, training in isolation and decontamination, and then manpower down the road if necessary uh, for isolation, uh, construction, uh, dealing with crowds or security. Uh, our tie to DHEC is uh, Dr. Brigadier General Chow, Jim Chow, you mentioned earlier. I'll say, Jim, do you have any remarks you want to make at this time? Uh, as you said, you know, right now we are working with both the civilian and the military leadership in uh, studying and resourcing the need for South Carolina. And, of course, we have folks who are have special components of the National Guard, that special skill and knowledge can be under your discretion. Thank you. Governor, we're talking about uh, 50 people that, are, that have the special capability with the civil support team and then about another 120 out of the chemical company that are being trained at this time to, to backstop them. We're also bringing lessons learned from the uh, Department of Defense as they support the efforts over in West Africa. Thank you, General. And if you could just go into a little bit of detail, because I think a lot of people don't realize that y'all do deal with biological and chemical um, substances all the time. But in a situation like this, you said that you had isolation units or isolation gear? We do. Uh, we have a, a civil support team. Each uh, state is allocated a civil support team under your control. And uh, they respond to probably two to five calls a week dealing with unknown substances. You get white powder in the mail or whatever, uh, and they will uh, obtain samples and then have them chemically analyzed. Uh, and, and again, they have the ability to isolate up to the highest uh, hazardous uh, material level. Uh, and uh, uh, of course, we can degrade it. Uh, and uh, the, we have uh, uh, sufficient suits and uh, isolation equipment uh, to uh, outfit our people and then the uh, chemical company too. Good. So uh, we, we can, if, if a hospital ends up with a little bit of a problem, because of just not having the right material on hand, if the uh, 
uh, virus would change, then we could certainly help on that level. Very good. Thank you, General. I appreciate it. And now we will turn it over to Chief Mark Keel of SLED. Governor, uh, just to bring you up to speed where we're at, we have 36 uh, weapons of mass destruction team members. 18 of those are certified in hazardous material operations level, and 18 are certified as hazardous material technicians level. All of those folks can be deployed on any chemical, biological type instance. We also have level A suits, which uh, offer uh, the most, the highest uh, protection in case they're needed. We also work very closely with 43rd CST. Uh, our guys uh, work with them on a, on a regular basis, uh, a weekly basis, and we will continue to uh, work in, uh, with them on uh, any case that's necessary. We, um, depending on the request or mission that we might have, we can configure our teams to meet any of the requests. Uh, we can configure it to be a, a backup team or to uh, decon and assist the team to ensure everyone's uh, safety should we have a, a problem. These teams can consist of two operators for general assistance or up to six operators if they're meant to secure a particular area or to neutralize some type threat. Um, all of our agents have personal protective equipment. Uh, we are in the process now of asking all of those agents again to uh, check their bags, make sure that they have everything that they need. We started sending out messages as early as October the 8th, uh, disseminating uh, uh, information regarding uh, protocols and guidelines that came from uh, Catherine and, and DHEC uh, to us. We sent those out both to the chiefs and sheriffs and to about 27 different sectors, uh, agriculture, banking, uh, utilities, uh, that we have through our fusion center, over 5,000 contacts that we've sent that to, and we're sending out a, another uh, uh, batch of information today to those same folks. We are prepared to provide uh, assets for public safety uh, wherever it's needed statewide, and we've also uh, implemented a plan to provide uh, escorts for any necessary transportation that needs to be done at the request of DHEC. Thank you. And, Chief, just it came to my mind, you probably have a database of all first responders, right? Well, we have a, we have a, a, we have a mixed database. We have all of our law enforcement, obviously, all of right. our chiefs and our sheriffs. We have many of our uh, 911 uh, centers uh, through the Fusion Center. But that, uh, our merge, emergency management, again, there's 27 different sectors that we communicate with through our Fusion Center, over 5,000 contacts there. I'm not going to say that we have every single one, but we have uh, we have a huge majority of those folks, or the chiefs or sheriffs, uh, fire chiefs, EMS, uh, emergency responders we have in that group. So a big, strong group there, too. That's right. Yeah, and, they, and SLED was, was kind enough to give us those. The, the problem that we've had is who don't we have Is we because it's not a mandatory database. But we've got... But that'd be a good start between that and then the EMD. The, the, and then, with the emergency management centers and the county governments. That's a good start. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, good. All right, thank you, Chief. Appreciate it. And now we're going to turn it over to those that would be, um, I mean, ground zero, I guess, is what we're talking about. I first want to thank our hospitals. I want to thank um, MUSC Palmetto Health and Greenville Memorial for stepping up. Um, you have always been leaders in this state, but this is a time where we just appreciate that so much. And um, Thornton Kirby with the Hospital Association, we have worked together. Um, I know we were on, had you on the conference call last week, and we appreciate that. Um, but just now want to hear from you. I'm going to say publicly again what I said to you last week, which is I don't expect you to tell me that you know everything and that you're ready and all of those things because I don't think that's realistic. You know, I think if we look at what happened in Texas, that was the problem was the hospital was expected to know all. I think when something like this happens, we want to know what you don't know. How can we help you? This is your team. These are this is your this is who's got your back. So at the end of the day, that's what I'm looking for here. It's not for you to say, Nikki, we've got this. This is all good. It's for you to say, this is what makes us nervous, or this is the part we think we could do better, or we don't think we're communicating enough on this. Now is the time where we could have that. And um, it's not about being good. It's about being great. And so trying to figure out how we perfect that going forward. So I open that dialogue to you, whether it's here or whether it's, um, you know, with EMD or, or DHEC or with me directly, is just 
feel comfortable letting us know what you don't have or what you do need because that's our job is to help you get it and and just so that you never feel by yourself in this process um, but Thornton I'll just turn it over to you and thank you for being here thank you governor and, and on behalf of all the hospitals we very much appreciate the tone that you've set which is for us to be uh, open and candid about where our strengths and weaknesses are uh, along those lines I would say first and most important thing we've been working every day with DHEC and and um, and weekly with EMD, making sure that we're uh, playing the proper role with those two lead agencies. Um, hospitals are prepared in this state. And as soon as I say that, I have to say also, we have to remain um, prepared every day with new guidance from CDC about um, what is the right temperature level for fever, what is the right, um, what is the new thinking about personal protective equipment and so forth. So even though we're prepared based on what we know, we know every day we have to wake up and get a little more prepared based on what comes in that, that next day. Um, you pointed out that we have a bit of a dis division of labor mm -hmm. emerging among the hospital systems. All the hospitals in the state are preparing to handle that initial contact. And as Catherine and I have said over and over and over, the, the first step is prepare and protect your workers. Mm -hmm. Second is to identify a, a patient who may have Ebola and then isolate them and then communicate with DHEC. And then we follow DHEC and CDC's lead on that. So the hospitals are working on that. Senator Peeler and the Senate Medical Affairs Committee had a hearing recently and they asked us about drills. Are hospitals doing the drills? As Dr. Bell pointed out earlier, there have been false alarms in recent days. People say, hey, I, I'm not sure. That's been a very effective way to do some real life um, tests of the system and we're learning things every day and getting better and better at it. So that's, that's been helpful. Uh, as you said, the three medical centers that are standing up as regional referral centers, they've already been coordinating. We met this morning and talked a lot about how we um, standardize training, how we standardize transport of patients, how we have um, coordination and communication um, so that it's uh, appropriate. And as you asked, Governor, last week, we've involved uh, General Chow to, uh, to help us okay. think about that. How would the military go about thinking about standardizing and making sure everything's in place? Um, as you asked, I've also begun to explore conversations about the PD and border hospitals with North Carolina and Georgia. Um, we are a step ahead of those two other states, best I can tell, in the fact that we've established regional referral centers. They're talking about it. They have not done it yet. As they do, we'll maintain conversations <coughs> with them. And, and uh, I think the, um, the primary concerns we have now are making sure we protect our workers and contain the virus if it ever appears in this state. Those are the two primary things. And then the other one is making sure every day we stay abreast of the latest <coughs> guidance that comes out. And, and I will say um, that one thing Catherine and I have talked about a lot is as the CDC changes its guidelines on personal protective equipment, we need to make sure we have adequate supplies. So um, we have adequate supplies now. As they change the guidelines, that will be our next um, big question. Thank you. And just a, a few questions. So in some hospitals, they have had optional training. Um, we haven't heard about a lot of hospitals that had mandatory training. How are your hospitals in general? How are they taking this in terms of, you know, we know everybody's putting out a video. At, at what point are they saying, okay, we want all staff members to go through this training, or are they still at the optional basis in terms of moving forward? Well, I can't speak for all of them. We've been asking this question. We met this morning to talk about standardizing the training guidelines. To what standard are we training? And the, the uh, challenge is the, the um, uncertainty that we have right now from CDC as they think about mm -hmm. changing their personal protective equipment. As soon as we have trained people to what they are used to, we, uh, we have to be sure we train if there are new guidelines. But I think the hospitals can probably help us um, understand how they're training. I know that uh, it's not optional in the emergency rooms, the urgent cares, the places that patients right. are likely to visit. That's not optional. That's a lot of good training going on. Um, but uh, whether, we're, um, whether we are trained appropriately all depends on what CDC is telling us is the, the right standard. And so we're monitoring that every day. And as they change the standard, we'll revise our training. Accordingly. Well, and I appreciate you working with General Chow. And the reason that I think that's so important is typically with a situation like this, the military is so black and white. It's very much step-by-step -step process. And there's a lot we can learn from that because there's a lot of efficiency in the way they do it. But then they're also a great backup. And so I want the hospitals to realize that this is a good backup that you have going forward. And I think there's we can only gain from learning what he's got in terms of that information. The importance of the 
out-of-state regional hospitals to North Carolina and Georgia, the reason that's important to me is it's good for us to have them on standby. I don't know that you'll ever need them, but I would love the fact that if you did, they're right there ready to help you. And so as I need to talk to those governors, we would do the same for them. I would want, I just think that we need to make sure that we do that. So as you have that, um, we can start that communication. But I just think it's real important when we do that, that we always do it regionally because it helps us not be so isolated and also helps that information going forward. And I don't know if you can do this, but it would be very helpful if there's any way we could, and it'll take you a while, I know, have all the hospitals tell us what they are doing, just in some way for us to know where every hospital stands in terms of if there happens to be an outbreak in a certain hospital, we know whether that's a high-level hospital, whether it's a low-level hospital, we'll know. It'll help us in dealing with the chief and, and the general in terms of what we're walking into before we walk into it, if there's a way to do that. And we can come up with what criteria that is, or I'm sure you can with um, Director Templeton, but something like that for us to grade our hospitals on how prepared they are. Um, it's not a judging thing. It's not something that it's more of just us knowing should something happen what we're walking into and We're already working on that together. DHEC's taking the lead on that survey and we're helping to make sure we get the responses It's it, so. only good can come out of right. that. So I appreciate that So now we have our three rock star hospitals and I appreciate that and these are in no particular order So don't take it as um, anything um, but that so I think we're going to start with dr. Patrick Cauley CEO of MUSC Medical Center Thank you, Governor. I'll just make a couple quick comments about our preparations and things we're learning and things we think um, should be stressed. Um, for, first, we think it was a great thing for each one of these hospitals to step up. This is built on the trauma system. It's built on the emergency preparedness system. The only way to really tackle this at the <coughs> provider level is to have a, uh, an emergency preparedness system that you already have and you build on top of that. If you had to build this today, it would be extremely difficult. So we support and we think and we've been in discussion with other hospitals as well that the regional system is the best way to go at this uh, point in time. As we get deeper and deeper into further training and further tactics we work on, uh, we, our team keeps saying the same thing. It has to be a regional system, at least to start in the beginning. Um, the other thing is that the regional centers not only take on a care, uh, care agenda if that, if that becomes necessary, but we also take on an education agenda along with the South Carolina Hospital Association. So we think all those things are important. A couple things about training. There's a lot of misinformation out there about training, um, particularly in that everybody in the hospital needs to get full training. Nothing can be further from the truth. And in fact, maybe some of the early mistakes of the last couple of weeks were to train too many people. Um, a small number of people in our hospital, probably less than 30, will be trained in the full, uh, the full gear. All right. Everybody else, all other 13,000 people, get what we call our contact tracing. And we use the acronym SIC, uh, screen, isolate, communicate, and keep calm. And everybody should get that, and we have to keep drilling that. We're finding that you can't educate enough on that, uh, and you have to make that education more personal. So anything that we can all do together to help educate more uh, would be better. We keep saying, and MU, uh, a calm MUSC community is a calm Charleston That's community. Right. <laughs> and so we, we keep, uh, keep after that. The other piece is volunteers. No one is going to take care of a patient they don't feel comfortable with. So first of all, they must volunteer. The other thing we're asking them to do is after they go through their training, whether they still want to volunteer. And we haven't had anyone drop yet, but we, we think there are circumstances where you may be too tired to, to deal with the gear or anything like that, we're going to make it real easy for you to opt out. So we think volunteer is a key piece to that. Um, the last piece that I, I think that I'm here with Dr. Rick Nolte, the head of our lab, um, Rick reminds me that if we start seeing large number of cases, we've got to figure out a way to get test results back quicker. Um, so at the current time when it's low numbers, not a problem, we can all deal with that. But if at some point as we, uh, as we do an exercise, we may want to look at the what-if scenario, if many more uh, patients were affected and we had to deal with screening faster. So that's something I'd lay out there, certainly not to be solved today, but something to think about in the coming weeks. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. And Chuck Beeman with Palmetto Health. Well, I'd like to echo what Dr. Kelly has said already uh, and very much uh, the same story at Palmetto Health. Um, I can 
tell you that uh, out of the 9,000 employees we have, we have concentrated in about 10 areas to make sure that everyone in those areas know exactly what to do and are well prepared to do that. We have been using the volunteer system as well. So we have a number of uh, employees that have been trained they're signed up and ready to go. Should the occasion arise that they wanted to opt out, there are others uh, that will quickly uh, fill in. Uh, there are main, three main themes that we've been uh, approaching. One is the detection. So as we learn more and more from CDC, DHEC, uh, the Hospital Association, American Hospital Association, we incorporate any new learnings uh, every day. Uh, we have a command post. We have one um, single entity that's responsible 24-7 for our response within Palmetto Health. And, and uh, so detection, uh, not only in the acute care setting, but also our, across our whole ambulatory network where patients come into physicians' offices and what do you do if you suspect uh, issues there and how to deal with that, and we're, we're prepared to do that. The second part is the protection. Uh, having the right supplies, having the right equipment uh, ready to go. Uh, and the third is the response, uh, being able to respond to any uh, patient that uh, comes in. Uh, there are protocols that have been established that we follow to protect our workers and to protect uh, the public. If there's a gap uh, in anything, it's one that is probably emerging, uh, nothing definitive, but uh, all of the costs to ramp up and to be prepared uh, currently is coming out of, uh, out of hospital funds, and these numbers are beginning to uh, mount up fairly qu quick. So I know there are funds available through DHEC and maybe, maybe other sources, but um, just to prepare uh, your organization uh, for, in our case, for this uh, region that we serve here in the central part of South Carolina, the expense to that is, uh, continues to grow. So it's just uh, one of those things we ought to think about a little bit uh, down the road. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. All right, now we'll go to Paul Johnson, Greenville Memorial. Thank you, Governor. Um, I echo a lot of the, the comments that have been offered by the two preceding uh, hospitals. The first thing that's just really <coughs> important for our community to understand is that we're not starting from a base of zero. We have an excellent trauma system in place, and we're very, very fortunate for that. So we've had disaster plans in place for a long, long time. Uh, one of the subcomponents <coughs> is biological um, uh, subcomponents and agents, and so we've been working and prepared for that. What we've been doing the last few weeks is focusing on our preparation that steps it up to this particular agent and some of the lessons we've learned recently uh, from across the country here and even uh, across the world there. Uh, so staff training's uh, a big focus of ours at the, at the point of, of first contact, as you mentioned. That's the part of our training that we would refer to as it's not necessarily optional. We've identified those folks that would be potential uh, first contacts. And for us, it would include not just the ED, uh, but certainly our urgent care centers and our medical offices, and we're training those folks on the screening protocol. They're identifying places to isolate patients and do all the things that the other uh, um, uh, hospitals are doing as well. Uh, another part of our focus, and probably the, the, the most important thing, is the protection of our employees. So personal protective equipment is very important. Uh, that's an area that's been a little bit of a changing uh, and moving targets. So that's been the biggest challenge around that. We've been prepared for disasters like this with regular equipment. We're learning more uh, from the experience across the country about other things. So we've, we've adapted our practice to that. We've adopted uh, a PPE uh, equipment gear that is beyond the CDC's current recommendations, and we're beginning uh, to train a smaller group of folks, just like the other hospitals, in learning how to, how to use that. We're using the buddy system as a way to monitor, uh, to bring that up. Uh, and like the other hospitals, we've been really heartened with the number of volunteers that have stepped forward. It's just a, a privilege to work with people that will step forward and volunteer to be a part of that. Uh, so the number of, of volunteers at our place is approaching uh, approximately 50. We'll be going through the training with them on the aspects of dealing with these patients uh, longer term, should they need longer term care. <coughs> have a number of, of things that have been going on in our facility to find an area to, to treat these patients uh, in a longer term. That's been done. I've uh, been putting transport arrangements in place. We've got an arrangement in place with a waste uh, management <coughs> firm as well. So we've got a number of the things ticked off uh, in continuing to work and refine that as, as we learn more about it. 
One of the things that we're fortunate about in our organization is that we are already linked in with eight other hospitals in the upstate that are part of our organization. So we've been reaching out and involving them in this discussion as well, and are beginning to reach out as well to other hospitals in the upstate to begin to develop communication links so that we understand each other's protocols and can begin to communicate on that basis. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Well, first of all, I, I can't thank you enough for what you already do. I love the fact that you're going with the volunteer program. It's the only way to go. And I just, I have a great respect for those that have volunteered, but I also have a great respect for the fact that you see that the best way to get the quality of care is to make sure we get people that truly know that they can do this. And so that, I think, speaks volumes about the people that work for you. And I hope that you'll pass along the thanks when you do that. Is there anything that you have heard today or anything else that you need from us or feel like is missing that we need to be working on for any of you? Yes, sir, please. If I could just speak to the, the point that Pat made, the, the rapid Ebola-specific testing is so in, uh, important in terms of triaging these patients. and. And I'm, I'm not sure um, what DHEC or the CDC is, is able to offer at this point. I've been on a couple of conference calls, and I understand, you know, if we had a patient that showed up at 3 a.m. in our emergency room and we needed to, to rule in or rule out Ebola, what's, what's, the ex, what, what's a reasonable expectation? Right now, and Dr. Bell will correct me if I'm wrong, it's a four-hour, so there, there are two tests, right? Well, you know, DHEC can test. And then the CDC is really the one that gets to decide if it's actually a confirmatory test. We'll have our first response back within four hours. So the CDC, though, is giving us 24 if something else happens that, you know, you and I can talk about the something else, but an outside of four days. But that's if you've got a fault. We're going off the four hours, right? right. So but, that's the way we've right. looked at it is that, yeah. you know, if they can go ahead and do this, um, blood draw and we can know in four hours no we may not get confirmation from them but should the four-hour results show anything we would go ahead and want to go into um, mode that yes it's a positive result and we need to move forward on that and, and DHEC is prepared to do that 24 7 3 in the morning was your example right okay. so yes. we set we set up we set up triggers to the at the governor's request for how we would treat those patients regardless of when the CDC comes back so you have a suspect you isolate, you protect everyone else. And while we are waiting for the CDC to tell us whether or not to blood draw, we treat that patient as a suspect and isolate. When we get the, the DHEC confirmation back, then it, it triggers another level. And at that point, we start talking about transport, we start talking about treatment, we start treating that patient like they have Ebola, even though we're, we haven't gotten the official confirmation from the CDC. And just another forward uh, looking <coughs> question about that. It, it appears that there may be some um, commercial companies that, that uh, migrate tests through the FDA through emergency use authorization. And thinking about local responsiveness, should that happen, how would that fit into to the, the management plans and the, it, determining the patient's true infection status? If, in fact, we have private companies that are allowed to and authorized by the CDC under their protocols to, to have a test with integrity and we can use them, we'll use the resources that are fastest and, and, and best, but we have to make sure we can trust them. Yeah. Yeah. So, so if that's the threshold, then of course. And I think, and I appreciate where you're coming from because the, the rapid response, you can't do a rapid response if you don't know what you're dealing with. And for us to get you those results so that you know exactly where to go, I think is extremely important. So I appreciate that. Any other issues that you see at this time? No. All right. Well, I think we're on that one. So we're um, good from that. Is there anything else that the state can be doing, um, Thornton, or for any of you going forward? I mean, I know we've done this, and you'll see that depending on what hospitals are in the mix, they would be on the conference calls, but we certainly would come to you for advisement as well as we go through this process. But is there anything else that you see that you could need from the state at this time? I would just say thank you for the fact that um, you, you and Catherine responded very quickly on the question of hauling hazardous waste. The other issue that remains um, difficult for us is finding out what CDC is going to have as guidelines for, for personal protective equipment and whether it's going to be available um, once hospitals know what they need to purchase and also other first responders. So uh, anything you can do with CDC would be helpful. And Thank what have we found out on that so far? 
It, well, what they're, what's happening is, is that advice is being updated based on lessons learned in Texas and in other places. And so right now, the state is okay with the current guidance. And we also are um, pulling together an inventory of what everyone does have so that if we need to pull it, we can. But we're waiting for the CDC to review the different instances they've had, and they're just becoming more protective. And so what we'll do is we'll reach out to the federal delegation, too, and ask them to put some pressure on them to let them know that at least we're ahead of the game, and but we want to continue to be ahead of the game and so that we need that as quickly as possible. So we'll make sure that we do that. Um, I want to um, also, I see that we have um, one of my favorite health care directors here, um, Tony Keck with Health and Human Services. I know you were not scheduled to speak, but I just wanted to open it up for you and see if there was anything that you wanted to say. I'll just add that um, our role in this is, is really um, to help mobilize our assets, which is mainly funding through Medicaid, uh, to, uh, to help pay for some of these things. And so I've had some conversations with uh, Thornton about how we might contribute to that. We're taking our lead from DHEC. Uh, we are able to communicate with about 11,000 different providers through our own alert system, but DHEC really needs to um, be the lead in developing those messages. Uh, we do care for uh, over 15,000 homebound individuals and um, educating the, the workers that actually go into those homes. I think about this during flu season, so there's no confusion about what's going on in the home is, is really important. And again, we'll be working closely with our medical directors and, and, and with DHEC. Very good. Thank you. Okay, and through this, we um, always have partners in this, and um, I know Chairman Harvey Peeler had a hearing on this um, at least last week or a couple weeks ago, but I thank you for being here um, because I know you're in charge of medical affairs. I wanted to just offer it to you if you have anything to say. Sure. Thank you, Governor. Governor, I fear no man and very few animals, but germs, germs don't have a conscience. <laughs> <laughs> and that's one of the reasons that the Senate Medical Affairs Committee met a couple of weeks ago. We invited DHEC and the Hospital Association to come and appear before the full committee. And uh, I appreciate those folks showing up and answering some pretty tough questions. Mm -hmm. At the end of that meeting, uh, we felt like that the state of South Carolina has its medicinal house in order. Mm -hmm. The challenge is my constituents feel that the neighborhood of the United States does not. Mm -hmm. And we can't become comfortably numb on this issue. It sounds like what we've heard from today we are ready. I mentioned to Director Templeton, I said, I'll hope for the best, prepare for the worst. Mm -hmm. And we've done that. But uh, Chairman Howard and I, legislatively, we are suited up. We're ready to go. My staff is in constant contact with your staff, DHEC staff, uh, the Hospital Association. Anything that we need to do uh, legislatively, we stand with you on this issue. Uh, anything that we can do to help DHEC, uh, we've had some suggestions from Director Templeton, and quite frankly, uh, if you ask me what would make us more comfortable, if the president would name Catherine Templeton as the Ebola czar, I'd feel more comfortable. <laughs> thank you. All right, thank you. Um, and now we'll go to Chairman Leon Howard. Um, I see your staff is here who taught me everything I know, so it's great to see you all here. Um, but I appreciate you being here as well. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, I, too, echo the sentiments of Senator Peel. Uh, we certainly appreciate the opportunity to have so much expertise around the room because we're all in this together. You know, Germs have no name, no, 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 no party, et cetera. Um, uh, we, stand, we stand ready, the 3M committee staff, um, to help to remove any barriers that may be in the way of expediting progress. And if you see something that our staff need to know about, uh, notify our capable staff, your office, or uh, any one of you around the room. What we don't want to do is, is drag our feet on something that um, there may be some reg that we need to promulgate to move forward. And so we stand ready to, to do that, uh, as Senator Peel said earlier. Okay, great. Thank you. And I also want to um, thank you. I know that we've had some conversations. If there is legislative, um, if there's some legislative issues that we find that we certainly will come to you and we know that y'all are ready to move forward. Um, so I think what you can see is that we have a lot in place. I know that we had one more. Um, is it Dr. Albert? Yep. Did you have something you wanted to add? You're with the USC School of Medicine. Correct. It's actually with Dr. Nolte, I was at Emory when we built a biocontainment unit over there. So we wrote that grant and it was built for actually that and I learned a lot from it. But the, the one thing probably that's important for this is another 
thing that was the anthrax episode, where we had no case of anthrax. We may never have a case of Ebola, but we had 70 well worried every day, which significantly affected every hospital system and everything that happened. So I think that piece of it, getting information communication out also through the press, the, the amount of hysteria is getting progressively high. Um, on the internet, in the hallways, on the water coolers, in the press, what, what's going on. So that's going to be a major focus of what we're going to be, be dealing with long before the first patient comes. And <coughs> we have to do more. The, this airborne thing, what is droplet, what is, what is virus in the air, what is, is the true aerosol. Um, there, there's very good examples of information from Dallas and from, from Emory that all their environmental samples were negative, that this is an RNA virus that has an envelope that doesn't stay in a human being, that goes away with, with water and soap and chlorine and bleach. Not with water alone, obviously, but all of these things, I think, would help us going into the flu season, not running into a major <coughs> 70 patients that say, I may have Ebola in an emergency room will shut down even these three centers fairly quickly, and we need to have some sort of strategy to, to get in front of them. Well, and I think that, you know, a lot of why we have done this is, one, because I think communication is the best to deal with any situation, and certainly education is key. Um, but I think the public needed to see how prepared we are. And I think that not only the preparation that has been going on for a long time, but to hear it. Because the truth is, the hospitals are about to get a lot of pressure. You know, there's a lot of people who have the flu that think they might have something. And on one side, we're glad they're being overly cautious, but on the other side, we want people to stay calm. And what I have said is I hope this is an issue we never have to deal with, but we are going to prepare for it as if we do, and we are going to make sure that we're doing everything that we can. And um, what I am incredibly proud of is how this team has pulled together. Um, there has been no issues whatsoever in terms of communication or saying, why don't we try this or why don't we try that? Um, but overall, seeing the communication and the resources and the ability that that will come together, any time we've had a disaster, we've done the same model. And any time we've had to do that, it works. And so um, what we'll tell you is we're going to continue to communicate. We're going to continue to make sure we help you with the things that that you need, that you feel like you're lacking in. So certainly working with the federal delegation on those issues and making sure we work with the legislative um, delegations as we need to move things forward, we will do that. Um, but I feel very, very good in the fact that we are preparing. We will continue to prepare. And when the time comes, we will be prepared should we need it. But, you know, we can all pray that that's not going to happen. But I want to thank you for your commitment. Thank you for your time today. Um, thank you for the education. And this will continue. Thank you very much.